All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch podcast. And today we talk about the question, are property investors evil? It's one of the questions you've asked us. We cover it as well as the timeless principle of owner-occupier appeal. What else do we cover today, Ben? Yeah, mate, and we're also double-clicking on the idea of investing in residential property in a self-managed super fund or Smurf. So we've got heaps to unpack in today's show. Heaps to unpack, folks. So let's rip into it now. Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the insider's guide to property, finance and money management. All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch podcast and welcome back to you too, mate. How are you? I'm well, mate. Yep, couldn't be better. All good. Hey, uh, how have you gone in the glow of the week um, for you, mate, since you had that wonderful experience yeah. last week? Have you, have you got any humility back or are you still, are you still full of swagger? Still in the afternoon. In fact, there's a group of us who are catching up tomorrow night to watch it, the replay, you know, and just to basically <laughs> all of the Pies supporters getting together to just revisit it one more time. But I've enjoyed watching AFL 360 and On the Couch and all of those other shows. You know, the grand final reviews. Oh, it was good fun. Good fun. Oh, it was beautiful. Hey, um, I, uh, I, I felt like I probably wasn't as positive last week as I should have been to encourage you, mate. So I found a little clip here that I thought we'd just quickly cut to um, just sure. so that I can contribute uh, to the dialogue um, for, for the Colin. You mean you're getting so, on board? You're going well, to get on board? Well, let's, let, let's, let's have a little listen and then you, you let me know if you think I'm on board or not, all right? So let's, sure, cut to, okay. let's cut to this little clip I found for you. Off you go. The floor is yours. Why are all Collingwood supporters vegan? Oh, I don't because know. you need teeth to chew meat. Oh, Byron! Byron! Byron, that is not fair! <laughs> go on, off you go, son. There are no vegan Collingwood supporters, all right? <laughs> yeah. He's a cheeky bugger, isn't he? All right, so um, I'm not sure so, that means you're on board, mate. <laughs> and that's a little shout out to Giancarlo, uh, who sent me a little Instagram post. Said all, all it said is, "There's a link to the um, video," and then he just said, "Here's one for Ben." So, mate, don't don't say I don't look out for you. Oh, yeah. So you didn't you didn't watch that beforehand and thought, yeah, actually that's perfect. Uh, <laughs> envy, well, I'll tell you, mate, envy. It's, I've yeah, been blindsided, right. Ben. I've been blindsided. I thought that was going to be positive, so I'm sorry about that, mate. In oh, advance, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> oh, very good. Well, I'm sure that'll be, um, I'm sure that'll be a lot of fun for you guys to get together and watch that, mate. I think it'll be wonderful. So we'll have a, we'll have a great time. I think that's <laughs> it. I think we're done on footy now, though. Or are we going to yeah, do yeah, trade? Most people who are listening to this who hate footy or, or who live in New <laughs> yeah, South Wales or Queensland, through. the best part of the year for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, just a quick one. Um, uh, stay tuned. Um, very, very soon we're releasing our new course, Ben, which is um, it's called yes. Unpacked, how to, how to Retire in 2000 a Week. So we've got a lot of people who say to us, sure, love the book. Uh, we'd like to dive a little deeper into the case studies at the end of the book. So we've, in fact, done that so that you can actually yeah. bathe in that and spend a fair bit of time and seeing the nuances and all those sorts of things. So uh, we are launching that upcoming. So for those of you who really want to, oh, for those of you who've read the book, I think this is um, this is for you. Um, yeah. um, for those of you who haven't read the book, it's actually a quick way for you to um, uh, get up to speed um, super fast on how to retire on $2,000 a week. But um, what I want to do, Ben, is if you um, if you want to leave a review, you'll notice a couple of weeks ago, we read out a, re a review and it wasn't even um, glowing. It was telling us that um, we need to pick up our socks um, as well. So if you leave a review during the week um, and we read it out um, in the next couple of episodes... Uh, we're going to give you a free copy, Ben, if we read it out Ooh, on the podcast right. of, of that course that's coming up. So, folks, um, let us know what you think. Um, leave us some details. We do read them. Uh, constructive criticism is welcome. Um, any feedback you want to give, um, we certainly be up for that. All you need to do is on your phone, there'll be a little section that you can write a review um, and let us know what you think. And um, our wish well, is And five Spotify stars. and Google, Google Play as well. We're going to sort of do it not just on iTunes. Sounds like a plan. 
Yep, hundred percent. So wherever you want to leave it, um, we will we will welcome the feedback and read it out, and we'll give you a copy of that. So, and also we've got summer series. We're in the um, we're in the shadows of summer now, Ben. So if you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash my story, um, my story, you can leave your details there. We'll reach out to you. Um, and I did the shout out last week. We want to do it this week. We want to hear from the ladies as well. So guys, pretty good to put yeah. the hands up. But we want to hear from the ladies, and we will share some incredible stories over the summer series so we've got a big show today ben um we've got more questions from our people from our community from our podcast yeah, community and they want to have them some great questions today great questions. they are rippers um they are really really good so stick around for that folks my mindset minute theme today i'm just sort of going and reliving some of the thoughts you know you and i caught up during the week ben you asked me how the tony robbins event went and there was lots of awesome takeaways so one of, one of the takeaways i want to share today with our community is the three principles of mastery, um, which uh, he shared. I think we've done that a fair bit um, ourselves personally, Ben. Um, some of our community got to do it too. But the first one is modeling, right? So you've got to model someone who's already achieved what you want. So clearly that's the hope that we have on this podcast. If you want to achieve 2000 bucks a week um, in passive income, Hopefully you can model us. If you want to learn how to build high-rise apartments or you want to learn how to subdivide and um, renovate townhouses and all those sorts of stuff, we're probably not the podcast for you. But if you want to know how to do a passive uh, income of $2,000 per week with um, two or three investment properties and do it in a conservative way, hopefully we can model that. So number one is modeling. Number two is total immersion. Um and I think that really, if you if you are a binge listener of our podcast, you've done a version of that. That's that's total immersion where you've just hearing the concepts, hearing us say it each week, um, talking it through. So um, we were in UPW for 50 hours over four days, Ben. It was intense. You never knew what the breaks were. You never know when it was going to start. The big tone turned up about an hour and a half late on day one. They never let us know what was going on. We were totally immersed in this experience. And I think it was... Um, really right for us to get some of the concepts that we were trying to master as well. So number one is modeling. Number two is total immersion. Number three is spaced repetition, right? So coming back and revisiting once you've been in that, okay, I've copied someone that I want. I've actually gone into this immersive experience and now I've got to keep checking in on a regular basis to actually um, have that repetition of work. So I think about that with our clients, right? And I go, okay, well, they, they're working with an advisor Um, So they've got those check-in points that happen in the review stage and they come back and see if they're on track. Um, There's also, we've got some courses that people can do the same thing as well. So, um, and and I guess if I've reflected on how that's worked for me, I'm sure you can reflect on how that's worked for you. Um, Some would say you're going into total immersion this week with your mates to watch the uh, the grand final again, Ben, to enjoy that experience. But um, um, so folks, just have a think about those three things. If you're trying to master something, um, whether it's guitar lessons, whether it's polo playing, whether it's property investing, those three things are what you need. Model someone who's actually achieved what you already want. Um, go totally immersed into what they've achieved so that you can actually uh, create an environment where it starts to rub off on you. And then the third one is spaced repetition. Have those opportunities once you move out of that immersive experience that you're tapping back into it to make sure that you uh, revisit some of the concepts so that you can go from just basic understanding to making sure that you master the process along the way. So there you go, Ben. That's one of the reflections. Nice one, mate. Love it. Love it. All right. Let's go into our first question today, Ben, and um, starts a little provocative, Ben. Um, Property owners are evil. Um, Or is that true? Let's have a little listen to the question that Boyd poses around that today. Hi, Bryce and Ben. Um, just want to let you know, love the podcast, find it very insightful, listen to it all the time. Um, my question today is around property investing and more around the ethical slash moral side. Um, you hear it a lot in the media, even friends and colleagues, they always scrutinise property investors as they're the evil people of the world trying to screw over all the poor, which um, I can agree to an extent, I would say. Um, my partner and I are very ethical and morally driven, we feel like, and we... Um, we're looking to invest next year and struggling to sort of decide whether we actually want to because of those reasons. Um, we feel we still will because, A, we want to better our, um, our lives and our future, but also I don't think we're going to be those type of people that 
we'll, we'll squeeze every bit of money out of everyone. Um, and a bunch of other reasons. I was just more wondering, um, how you would answer that sort of question if someone said that to you, because, and if there's any, um, other reasons why which would maybe help us in our journey other people in a journey that are sort of um up in the arms about it thank you very much for your time ben are property owners all evil yeah it's a it's a massive question um it's something that i I, i've found comfort in knowing my position on that so you know from from the very beginning when i was in my early 20s i want to be self-determined Right, so I wanted to. Obviously, I was aspiring. I wanted to make sure that my future aspiration and where I sat in that future was basically going to be self-determined. So I just set about uh, looking for ways to be able to build out um, investments and being in a position where I didn't have to worry about money. Um, now, does that make me a bad person? Well, I'll let others judge that. Um, but in terms of the sort of way in which I want anyone who's thinking about investing in property. Uh, I, there's always helpful when you put some context around that. And the easiest way I put context around investing in property is it's been around for millennia. Like in terms of as we move from caves and, and into a, you know, biologically moved into society living, ultimately you needed, you know, for those cities or towns to move into cities, you needed that change to occur. And you needed inns and you needed sort of, you know, places where people could have short-term accommodation and then move into medium to longer term before they eventually settled into that society. So societies and cities have been built on this concept of providing accommodation for those people who are transient moving in or who choose to have flexibility as part of their life. I think what's happening is the narrative is being stolen by some who are trying to change that narrative into um, that we're greedy. Now, if that is the context, then the simple answer I have is, so does, does that make the Marriott Group, um, Intercontinental Group, Sheratons, Hiltons, all of those other, you know, hotel and accommodation providers, you know, who predominantly have their money going offshore internationally in terms of the profits, are they also doing the wrong thing? I mean, you know, if we go back to the AFL Grand Final, how could you get all of those international visitors coming here if there wasn't accommodation provided for them? So I just think it's really narrow-minded when people think this way. And I, you know, ultimately, you know, if we want some form of egalitarian society, I think we've got to be realistic about what that looks like in terms of, you know, where we're sort of saying equal rights and equal opportunities. Well, the reality is, depending on which household you actually get born into, um, no household is even or equal. And I, I want everyone to, to think about in this great country of ours that there is still a massive opportunity for where you're able to be self-made. So irrespective of the circumstances that were delivered up to you, I'm a strong believer in the fact that if you get educated, work really hard and smart and immerse yourself like what Bryce was saying in into the subject matter area, you can turn your situation around. So rather than being a victim, you can actually change the story in the course of your life doing that. So I'm still a believer in that. Um, yes, is it harder for some to get into the property market in terms of these higher values and bigger deposits that you need to make? The answer to that is yes, but it's it's definitely not impossible. I mean, there is so much opportunity to be able to get into the property market. You've just got to understand what opportunities are in front of you. Hey Boyd, you, you pose a really good question, and so um, I agree with all of what Ben said too. And and but here's here's the thing I've observed about human behaviour over now doing this. Um, I'm in my twenty fifth year of property investing, right? Is that people um, people around? Because here's the bit where you said you hear a lot of the media, and then you said even friends and colleagues always scrutinise um, property investors as the evil people. I want to lean in on the friends and colleagues bit, Ben, because they're the people that are. Uh, immediately around our world, right? Because the media is obviously out there, mm -hmm. but it's those friends and colleagues. And here's a simple truth that I've observed, Ben, that people want, the people around you really want you to do well, but as long as it's just not better than them, right? Yeah. So, so whenever you go, so whenever you go and um, learn a new skill or you go and spend your time 
like I did in four days in um, the room with people who want to grow, everyone goes home and all of a sudden their friends, they want they, they want you to have a good time, but they just want to make sure you don't go too far ahead of them, right? So yeah. how was that sort of personal development thing that you did, right? So I think um, if we're all if we're all conscious of the fact that people around us really want us to do well, but just not better than them, and they're not sometimes consciously not even thinking that, Sometimes their opinions can be projections of fear or um, envy or whatever on you. So they might not have the eyes that um, people want you to do as as well as possible as long as it's not better than them. So that's our baseline point. And then secondly, um, if you if you have a spectrum of people that are in the world trying to um, make a better life for themselves, at one end you've got um, fully altruistic um uh, people full of integrity. And at the other end, you've got people who are just 110% only in it for themselves. But yeah. along that spectrum, you can still actually self-fund what you're doing. Because where, you know, to Ben's point, um, if, you th- if, you, if you listen to the, to the message that we've talked on this podcast over a long period of time, it's usually us saying, you need to probably get two or three of these investment properties. You, you never hear us say get 10 plus. You never hear us say, he who dies with the most property wins. You never hear us have the equivalent of me and Ben going out because you know, we both like fishing. So the two of us go out for a day of fishing and we just catch and catch and catch and catch and just keep putting fish in the boat for the reason just because we want to catch them versus how much do we actually need to feed our family? Let's take um, some fish for Ben's family. Let's take a few fish for my family. And actually, we've got a few neighbors that we know love fish. So let's take a few for them as well so we can share it around. But the rest, we catch them and we throw them back. We catch them and we throw them back. So if we use that analogy, that's the same thing that we want to do here with building um, wealth. How much do you need to fund your own uh, retirement? In our case, two or three. And then and then have a baseline of ethics around that. Don't be a slumlord. If you've got the opportunity to contribute to your tenants, if they're um, if you could put the rent up 150 bucks a week rent, um, but you only put it up 30 bucks. All the things that Greg B spoke about last week in the podcast form the baseline. So, and the alternative is, okay, if you don't do anything here, Boyd, the alternative is you totally lose control at a time when you don't want to lose control. When you're a bit older, um, you're a bit, in, in a lot of cases, you're a bit lower on energy and you've got less of a runway to recover. And the pension is something that you do not want to rely on. You want that to be a safety net, not be the goal in and of itself. So, to, to Ben's point with a whole lot of those economic um, reasons why you can positively contribute, I would always just remember that people are always going to have an opinion about what you want to do. And generally speaking, it's a projection based on their own beliefs. And generally, it's going to be on the fact that um, we don't mind how good your life is as long as it doesn't get any better than mine. Yeah, it's really, it's it's sad to see that the narrative is going towards those, that, those have-nots. Now, again, Australia is technically quite egalitarian, right? We do want to basically see everyone come along as hard as we can, but there's got to be effort in that. What we don't want to basically see is a society that just expects that they're entitled to certain things. And so from our point of view, that is that self-determination. And we have been consistent in this podcast pretty much from the first 20 episodes. If it is to be, it's up to me. And ultimately, we're trying to provide that education for you, you know, that immersion that we've been talking about, those actions, the modelling of the behaviours, all that education piece to basically put you in a position to say, well, I now want to be able to go on, execute on this, and I'll only take a couple of properties, that should be enough, plus my super or whatever, and I will be fair and reasonable um, with my tenants in terms of their expectations and hopefully they'll have quiet and safe enjoyment of those properties. And over time, um, that wealth will be built up for me and my family, and that will be able to provide opportunities and experience for those. I think if we lose sight of that and we just think that everyone has equal rights to everything, um, you know, people get lazy. And ultimately, that's not what we want to see in our society over the, over the course of the next 20, 50, 100 years and so forth, because your society will continue to keep fragmenting. Um, And yeah, you know, some of the greatest joy we have in the work that we do with our clients is helping the nurses, the teachers, the police officers, the fireys, the ambos, um, the public servants, the social workers who are doing all of the great work that they do and the purposeful work that they do. 
but they're also saying to themselves that the income that they're earning, which is modest, average, um, is not necessarily going to be enough to provide them with, you know, uh, enjoyment in retirement. And so by getting one or two investments um, and being able to have those as a business to the side, because that's what it is, you're a small business owner, you know, small business owners, 2.2 million of us have invested hundreds of billions of dollars in providing uh, accommodation across Australia. And I don't want to lose sight of that because the moment we do, and then we expect government to provide that accommodation, or we expect big business to provide that accommodation, the small business owner, which is the property investor, misses out. So I think there's enough in what we're putting forward to sort of say, I think it's fair and reasonable for me to look at my family and to look at you know what I want to be able to provide for them and go about working hard and smart and planning to become what I plan to become. Yeah, so so Boyd, I, I put my head on the pillow very comfortably at night um, as a property investor, knowing that we're creating accommodation for some people who um, who who require that to be provided. I'm taking on an element of risk that um, is commensurate to the return that I want to get from the property. To Ben's point there about small business owners, um, I don't look at my local fish and chip um, operator or the small uh, the cafe or the small business all around me. I don't look at them as evil people because they're trying to get ahead and they're taking the risks and trying to provide for their family. So it appears from your question that it's um, that this is the first time that you're considering property investing. Um, what I would say to you is once you've taken the plunge, um, once you've actually invested in the market and then you've actually seen the real risks and um, the extra, uh, I guess, um, responsibility that you're taking on, uh, hopefully you'll see what we see um, from the insider's view on what it's like to be a property investor that you're adding value. And if you stay true to your values around wanting to make sure that you take, don't take advantage of people, you'll be one of the great landlords um, in this country that's providing rental accommodation for people that need it. So um, have a have a listen to last week's episode again if you've missed that um, and have a listen to what we read out with Greg B. That'll give you an insight into someone who's um, taking action, investing in property, but also doing it in an ethical way um, that I think that you will feel comfortable with. So, all right, good question, Boyd. Thank you. Hopefully that's helped. Um, let us know, folks, if you see it um, any any other way on socials, let us know if there's any feedback we can give to Boyd in an upcoming episode that you found helpful for you if you were feeling the same way. Next question is from Milland, um, and it's a question regarding uh, buying property through self-managed super fund. Let's have a little listen to the question now. Hi, uh, I don't see any dedicated uh, episode on SMSF uh, or buying property through SMSF. Uh, most buyers get stuck at the second property because of uh, inadequate equity or borrowing power and SMSF is, is buying property through SMSF is, is really one of the good options, but I don't see a dedicated episode on that. So can you please cover that in detail? Thank you. All right, Ben, we have covered SMSF uh, over the journey. Um, There's probably a good chance for us to uh, revisit some of the basics here um, as well to help this question for Millen. But um, uh, I guess my first thing around SMSF is um, what we're about to talk about now is just headline information to help you um, ask a suitably qualified professional. So if you're taking advice on um, buying properties uh, through SMSF from a podcast, um, I would heavily caution you against that because you shouldn't do that. So hopefully what we're going to discuss today will give you some conversation starters to have um, with the people that you've surrounded yourself with who can provide you the advice on this, Ben. But um, SMSF, Ben, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I think the first thing we need to think about is that effectively super is a tax structure. Um, you know, let's go back to the very, very basics of why we, you know, why there is super. The government needed to provide, uh, you know, basically pensions. They realised that households will keep spending and there won't be any money left over. So they set up this structure where money was uh, basically shaved off from your wages and put into a super fund. Now, in terms of a self-managed super fund, as opposed to going into a retailer industry fund, you now have the ability to set up your own fund. Now, as part of setting up your own fund, you can have up to six members of that fund. 
And what was introduced several years back was this ability to potentially borrow money associated with the self-managed super fund. And that's obviously introduced this ability to have leverage. And that's called limited recourse borrowing arrangements. And it's really key to understand what's basically going on here in terms of the members, uh, the contributors and the trustees of the self-managed super fund. In terms of setting up um, to actually borrow money to buy residential property, this is direct residential property, you'll need to obviously have a relationship with the lender. Um, they will need to take the security of the asset and you need to be able to run this through what's known as a holding trust. Okay, so where the title is held in that holding trust by the trustee and in terms of the limited recourse borrowing arrangements, that's structured up between the asset and also the self-managed super fund. So mortgage repayments will still come out of the contributions that are going into the self-managed super fund, um, you know, and that's, that's effectively the arrangement. And so effectively the fund itself isn't borrowing, but through a structure through this holding trust, and it's different, the slight tweaks in each state and territory. So you must get um, specific advice in this area. So we are again saying we're, we're sharing general knowledge here. This is not a recommendation to invest inside a self-managed super fund, but that's that's the fundal, fundamental. So then you start thinking about, well, what are the pros versus what are the cons of being able to buy inside a self-managed super fund? Well, the first one is you can obviously use borrowed funds and that can help with accelerating the returns that you're getting through the fund over time. Um, it allows for a portion of diversification. So in, in most cases, um, any type of super fund will have a portion of cash, uh, shares, bonds, managed funds as the, their primary investment vehicles. So this now introduces the ability to have direct residential property. Um, and so that, that's an important one. The other thing that I did mention before about the tax treatments. Now we've seen, and, and, and I've been on record and Bryce has been on record, that you cannot guarantee that the governments won't continue to keep tweaking the tax legislation when it comes to super. So, you know, they are continually looking for ways that's politically palatable to take more tax from us. And so we're seeing now the current government's looking at a $3 million cap in which they will start to uh, tax at a 30% tax rate as opposed to 15%. But right now, if you're, if you're thinking about entry level here, the attractions here are it's a 15% tax rate on income, um, and that obviously includes rent. And then in terms of when you're in, uh, in that's in the accumulation phase, when you turn your fund into a pension phase, um, if you're under that $3 million range, then any sort of income generated is tax free. Now, if you're listening to this in five years time, <laughs> I'll probably question that. I suspect there'll be more changes, but that's, that's the attraction in terms of um, what that looks like. There are lots of technicalities, and I'm sure Bryce will mention a few of those when we start talking about the cons. Yeah, well, uh, so the, a few cons to think about is your negative gearing benefits are limited because the upside of that 15% um, uh, tax rate is is great when you move into income in there. But clearly the negative gearing phase is you're not getting the same benefits as you would if you're paying um, tax at a 40 plus percent um, tax rate. So there's that. Um, you clearly got limited liquidity um, when you've got property versus um, other more liquid assets like shares. Um, you can't equity release. If you want to renovate the property, you've got to have cash. You can't borrow for those sorts of things. Interest rates are higher. Um, so basically, you're locked into a super environment and all those associated rules. So therefore, there's a bit of concentration risk, as well as what Ben said earlier about um, the setup and ongoing costs, right? So there are definitely pros of having um, property in in your super fund, right? And largely, if you've, if you've maxed out in your um, own name, keeping momentum going in an asset that you believe in um, is is an ideal um, uh, place to keep going. But um, what we've observed is it can be a spruker's paradise as well because yeah. people use that as a way to get you to buy the wrong assets. So everything we've talked about on this podcast, um, the spruikers often have the right information from a strategic outlook, but it's when they execute on the asset um, that it's let down. So that's no different when you come into the super environment as well. Um, so the asset is super important, right? And there is a couple of ways that you can think about it. If if you if you are more advantageous to have higher income in the super fund because of the tax environment, that's one thing to think about. What type of asset you buy? The other one is um, 
if you if you have a combination of property and stocks and shares um, and bonds within the super fund, if you have one good quality asset and you hold it for long enough and it sort of doubles or um, better in value based on how long you have it, what you can do is you can reach um, the the retirement age, have liquidity through um, the cash and the shares that you have. And at some point, you might want to be in a position to um, sell the property, um, which in an environment like the current super rules means that selling in a in a um, super environment versus selling in your own name has some serious benefits to you because you can then have the cash, um, maybe invest that into um, um, stocks or shares, um, a fund that's paying good yields and also having um, tax imputation credits that mean the combination of the income and the tax imputation credits could mean that the cash flow that you have in your super fund in retirement might be superior to what you would do in your own name. So there is a hell of a lot that you need to think about when considering whether or not you would put property in a super fund. Um, At headline level, there's a lot of amazing benefits from doing that, but it really always comes down to the same thing because when you're when you're buying it in your own name and when you're buying it in a super fund, it is the same game, just different rules. And if you've got you've got to understand the nuance of those different rules and how they apply to you and what you're trying to achieve in terms of the cash flow requirements that you're trying to get in um, retirement that make all the difference here. Same game, different rules, and those different rules is the reason why you need to get an advisor to help you with this. Now, to give you some context of what Bryce and I are talking about, obviously, we have thousands and thousands of clients inside our Empower Wealth business. And we can also say to you that we have just a couple of hundred of self-managed super fund uh, clients who are looking at property and who are investing in direct residential property. Now, there's, there's a good reason for that is one, obviously, our investment committee and how we look at treating people's money. We're very conservative about how we pe- treat people's money. Now, some of the big things that that are really important to understand is that um, as the trustee of the fund, you're in total control. Total responsibility is on your shoulders. Now, you can outsource some of the administrative work, but ultimately the fund and the decisions that are made in the fund are the responsibility of you as the trustee. And there are serious consequences and serious financial penalties if you are non-compliant inside your self-managed super fund Um, you know, situation. So we take the conservative approach to our clients where we say, we we potentially want to get the, you know, the two to three properties that we mentioned before. Usually we're using personal names um, in a lot of cases in terms of doing that. Now, if you've been able to demonstrate over the five or seven years that we've been working with you, that you're competent in money managing those properties, you're competent in your financial literacy, you're demonstrating good administrative services using the more platform, showing us evidence that you, uh, you know, this would be something that you could handle. And then you also understand that there's a minimum requirement in terms of the amount that the fund needs to have to make it worthwhile for you. You need to understand that there is a very cost, heavy cost burden in terms of running your own fund, including, you know, obviously all of the, the trusts and companies that you may be setting up the holding trusts, et cetera, and then the annual tax um, auditing that goes on with that. If you pass all of those criteria, and you're saying to Bryce's point about, um, I want to continue to keep building out the opportunity for me and my family, it's only then that in, in our considered in our considered view is that we would start to open up the dialogue around that particular conversation. So we are talking about people who are potentially in their uh, 40s, um, you know, and have in excess of two hundred or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars inside that fund as a minimum starting point around that. Now there are always exceptions to the rule if you're, you know, highly qualified, if you studied in this area, and and you think that you you know you're you're demonstrating those competencies as part of that, then you might be sort of an exception to that rule. But there's a general idea in terms of the approach that we take. We're very careful when we're handling other people's money. It's different, I suppose, when it's our own money and we're willing to assess 
judgment of risk and reward and just how much is at risk at any one time. But certainly when it's other people's money, that's the type of approach that you would want a professional advisor to have with you. So to back to Bryce's point about the Sprukers, they're just trying to sell you something that they've got to sell, which is whether it be the self-managed super fund, but it's more the big commissions that they're going to make on the house and land package or the off the plan property that they're trying to qualify you for because maybe your personal circumstances don't allow that to happen. So be wary of those types of people. So it is a journey. Investing is a journey, building up that knowledge base, building up you know that competency levels over 10, 15, 20 years is the sensible way to go about it. So you're not going to be missing out if you're thinking you're in your early 30s and you want to set up a self manager Just have some patience. You know, investing is about playing the long game well. And so as you build up that competency and that skill set, then that opportunity will uh, potentially prevail to you. And then you can have a considered conversation with your partner or with the people that you want to bring into that particular fund. But it's, I mean, I have a fund, I've got a couple of properties in the fund, and I know from a compliance and an obligation point of view, it takes a fair bit of work. You know, we talk about in the book, 10 hours a year or 10 hours a month, a year, I should say, for running a, a standalone individual property. This is very much more in terms of the administrative duties that are associated with that. And you've got to have a good accountant, you've got to have a good financial planner, and you've got to be working in concert to, to basically get the best result for yourself. And, you know, I've talked about the strategy that I use in terms of getting higher yielding properties and properties that I might be speculating a little bit more on, but that's my journey. And I wouldn't recommend that for anyone who hasn't, you know, walked the walk that I've walked on the journey that I've been on. So, Millen, to your original question, you said most buyers get stuck at the second property because of inadequate equity or borrowing power. So that kind of is is suggesting that you may have already got investment properties in your portfolio. Um, to Ben's point, you ideally want to have, you know, a couple just so that you know what it looks like in your own name. But if you are hitting those ceilings, it might be something that you consider. So if you went through and with an advisor, you went through the pros and you went through the cons and between the two of you realised that um, that's something that you want to do. Here's some experiential um, advice that I'll give you from from buying properties for people in their self-managed super fund, if I put my buyer's agent hat on here. Um, the name on the contract is very important and mm. quite often uh, in a lot of cases is state specific. So if you've gone through um, to set up the self-managed super fund, you've gone through and you've created the bear trust, you've gone and got that limited recourse borrowing arrangement in place and you everything's ready to go, you will, you will want to stay very close to your advisor and ask them specifically what needs to be included on the contract and it doesn't necessarily cross borders as well because there's different regimes because if you get that wrong and then you go to the bank and you've got borrowing involved, in some cases you've got to go back and get the contract redone, which means um, avoiding the one that you've got, updating with the new one, which if you're in a fast-paced market, that can be a challenge. And in some cases, in some states, that may trigger um, additional stamp duty as well. So I cannot be more um, uh, vehement around. You, you've got to make sure um, if you're going down that path that you get the name on the contract specifically as it needs to be to marry up for the lending as provided to you um, from your advisor. But um, a lot of people might have questions like that, Ben. Yeah, you've just sparked one final tip for, for me, Bryce. And well, what a lot of people don't also realise in the establishment of the self-managed super fund, you've got to have an outlined and documented investment strategy in terms of what the fund is going to do. So if you've got no reference to direct property or residential property, then you're in breach straight away. You, you, you basically, so if you then go off and think, oh, I'm going to go and buy an investment property, but it's not documented in terms of the investment strategy as set up by the initial setup of the fund, you can't actually do it. So, you know, there's fines and, and you know, so that's that's what I was sort of saying. So we are, I'm intentionally making you scared about this potential opportunity because you need to be advanced. You need to have, you know, that financial literacy and competency that we were talking about before, before you entertain something like this. I had a friend of mine reach out just this week and said, can you actually borrow money inside a self-managed super fund? And I'm like, for that particular person um, who will probably be listening now, I'm sort of saying, mate, there's a journey that I need to take you on. This is not something that you're just going to, you know, it's going to be easy to do. And so we want to be very careful about the execution and I want them to be able to build up their knowledge before they even consider it. Ben, if you love autonomy um, and not having anyone looking over your shoulder and having to justify your decisions, 
the self-managed super fund environment <laughs> is not for that because you, as you said, you've got to justify your strategy. You're going to have an audit to check over your approach. And if you uh, color outside of the lines, um, there are serious consequences from doing that. Whereas if you, if you do all that outside in your own name, you color outside of the lines, there's a whole bunch of autonomy and freedom that comes from that. So yeah. it is an environment that is because of the fact that you can't touch it until the future. Um, there is a lot of guidelines and rules um, that need to be obeyed to make sure that everyone doesn't go off doing their own thing. And in fact, the very thing that is a fundamental, I think, a real strength um, of our country is the fact that we are looking to uh, put some money away for the future and we don't want to jeopardise that by making silly decisions now or making reckless decisions or even ignorant decisions that you didn't know about. That's, um, that's no good because the auditors will certainly let you know. All right, let's go on to the next question, Ben. This one is from Kate. Um, this one's a Facebook question, um, so I'll read it out. But um, it's the question, uh, it's an age-old question, Ben, um, and I wanted to revisit it because it, I'll never get tired of telling this um, particular principle to our community. But uh, the question is around why do we need owner-occupier appeal? So let's have a little listen. Uh, let's have a little read out of Kate's question. Hi, guys. Love the podcast, but I'm struggling to see why you would hunt down properties that have owner-occupier appeal and good long-term capital growth if you also advocate to hold the properties for the long-term and never sell. If you are never selling them, then why does that matter? Wouldn't you want to find high-yielding properties and enjoy cash flow now in, in retirement? Sorry if this is an ignorant question. Thank you, Kate. It is not an ignorant question, Ben. This is a very, very good question that everyone needs to understand this basic fundamental premise of property investing. Yeah, and there's no such thing as a silly question in our eyes, Kate. We'll take any question at any time that helps people understand what the opportunity and the risks are associated with any type of investing that you do around resi property. Can I take one step back and just take a 30,000 foot view on this particular question? Because I think it, it really does, again, come back to this sort of context theme that I'm on in this episode. And that is this. There's, there's two fundamental things that you need to consider for yourself. And if I'm also wearing my property advisory hat, there's, these are the two fundamental things that I would be considering if I was to develop a strategy for you and, and you know, as part of that particular story. And these, these are it. Number one, your risk profile. So I want to get a sense of basically what type of ap appetite you have for debt, how you are looking at managing your money, all of those things before I then start thinking about strategy. But number two is also your financial means. Now, we mentioned earlier in terms of some people are very fortunate where they've landed in a household, where they've got lots of wealth, they might have lots of equity, they've got the bank of mum and dad, uh, they've also obtained a really good job and we need to make assessments and you personally need to make assessments on your financial position. So the first thing I always think about is what type of income have we got? What are your plans, both personally and financially? And then I'm trying to understand effectively what sort of borrowing power that will allow you to be able to do something. Because what we're here and what I'm going to be talking about, you know, as we unpack this particular question, is why capital growth is always going to be king um, in terms of chasing rental yields. But they are limitations. So in other words, what I don't want to say to young people, Kate, is that this is the only way to have success when it comes to property investing. But what I am saying is if you are limited where you do have modest income and, and you do need that rental income because you're also limited by borrowing power, there is still a wonderful way in which you can create wealth over time. Okay, that, so don't think that that's not a possibility and that's not a viable strategy for, for many a people, especially some of the younger people who need to get into the market. So we're seeing more of that in that low entry level price point where they're chasing that and they are forcing a lot of demand in that area and they're also enjoying some um, strong capital growth. But on the other hand of that, if, you, if I've got above average or high income, then my strategy, and, and I think you know to, to give context to our first 20 episodes of this, of this podcast, Empower Wealth is a business that was originally set up to help time poor professionals who had medium to high income at that time, right? And so we were buying into those particular strategies and the negative gearing part of that and looking at long-term capital growth 
was the decision that we could make for those particular clients. And when I come back to talking about the risk profile, one of the important questions that Bryce or I or any of our advisors would ask the question is if we are going to go into some of these lower socio-demographic areas and we are looking at the types of tenants who we may be out, and I don't want to generalise here because I understand the sensitivity of what I'm talking about, but do you want a tenant who is battling to pay the rent, who may be you know, in a situation where their circumstances change or whatever, and you get a really challenging tenant or you get a tenant that's potentially going to damage the property? Now, a lot of those time poor professionals were happy to forego potentially chasing multiple properties at that lower, that higher yielding area, because they just wanted to get a couple of solid assets and manage them over time and basically have less of their important personal time dedicated to running this small business. So that's the context in terms of any investor. They need to know what pathways are available to them. And then when you're thinking about those pathways, um, in, in the case of a higher income earner, the pathway is potentially that they can use a lot of their surplus income to be able to get into that particular market. So I think that's that's an important contextual um, overlay that's 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 valid for all of the community in terms of the decisions that they need to make when they're effectively planning to become what they plan to become. So so why does it matter um, is probably the next part of that question. And I think for me, it's just all about the numbers. Um, and you know, I've got I've got a, a simple example here, and I'm using. Um, Victoria and Melbourne as, as an illustration. And thanks for, for letting me take the floor, Bryce. I'll just, I'll just run through this one if we can. Um, so what I did is I went back to 1980, okay, and I looked at the median house price rolling 12-month average from 1980. So that's 42 years and six months up until June 2023. Now, I picked an inner city area of Carlton um, where obviously you've got a mixture of, of small um, side-by-side semis, and you've also got some more lovely Federation Edwardian and some period-type homes with owner-occupier appeal. And then I picked a, an outer suburb area um, of Craigieburn, which would be judged as um, the mortgage belt, probably could also be judged as working-class communities around that particular area. And so the median house price in Carlton at that time was $48,750, and the median house price in Craigieburn was $37,000. $425. Now that's still a 30% variance between those two price points. Now let's fast forward until June 2023 and the median house price in Carlton now is 1.45 million and the median house price in Craigieburn is 400 sorry $645,000. So what we've seen is in terms of percentage terms Carlton's had 2874% gain and Craigieburn's had a 1,623% gain. So the, the CAGR, so the annual capital growth return on Carlton is 7.47 uh, uh, and for Craigieburn is 6.93. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's that 42 year period. So you're seeing that the gain in terms of the monetary gain for uh, Carlton was 793,000 in value gain, um, you know, over that time period. So you, you're looking at an enormous amount of gain over that time period compared to Craigieburn. So that's what you're banking. Um, now, you haven't sold the property, Kate, so I understand your point there. But here's the other thing. When you look at the median rents, the median rents um, based on the latest data, we have $785 per week. So $40,820 over um, Craigieburn. Uh, for, sorry, that's Carlton. And then Craigieburn, $483 per week which is $25,116 over the year. So that's a 62.5% improvement in terms of the cash flow that also comes off that property. Now, again, let me reiterate, um, that doesn't mean that you, know, you should be trying and saving up forever to try and get into those particular markets. You may need to put your foot on the property ladder in, in the strategy that you might be talking about, which is entry level, higher yielding to get started on in the property market. But for those people who might be coming in in their late 30s or 40s, which is really you know the work that we do predominantly with the Empower Wealth business, 
Um, they've got equity in their current home. They're normally time poor double household income professionals. And so we would consider working with them about buying higher value assets. And for our younger audience, we are now working with them in terms of helping them buy uh, more entry level with a little bit more yield to basically get them started on that journey to be able to release that. So how do I answer your question around never selling? Why does it matter? Well, equity release matters um, in terms of the ability to be able to get that. And then obviously the ultimate amount of money that I'm banking um, is still higher in the rental side because I've got a higher valued asset which I can charge a higher rent for. And then ultimately um, I'm building an estate and that is going to be passed down through my legacy um, into the family and they can then choose to do what they want with it. They can keep it and build on that um, if you're building that for your family and your estate planning, or they could potentially be allocated out to family members. And if that becomes their principal place of residence, um, there is no, you know, no transfer taxes associated with that as well. So there are a lot of reasons why when you think about performance of an asset and performance of a location and the ultimate land value that's going to grow over time, we do know that there's a gravitational pull to those bigger cities where you are going to get those overall returns. Uh, Kate, um, you, you just got a masterclass then on um, asset selection. So um, all I'll add to that is um, uh, justify via emotion and justify via logic. So owner occupiers justify a decision based on emotional reasons, um, usually something to do with the street, the schools are nearby, family and friends, connections, networks. Um, so it's an emotional decision why they want to buy the property, whereas investors are purely logical based. Now, it is true that some investors get emotional, but generally speaking, it's a calculated decision. And this is best on show when you go to an auction and you see that two people have come to buy the one property and they've both set limits. And the amount of times you see it on a television show, you see it when you're live, that the person who's come, they're emotionally invested in the property for whatever reason. And they might spend 10, 15, $20,000 more, $100,000 more than they plan to just because of that emotional investment. As an investor, you effectively want to ride on the coattails of those owner occupiers. So number one, emotion versus logic. Number two is you want to buy properties that banks like, because for most people who are investing in property, they generally need the help of a bank or some financial institution to do that. Now, if you buy a property that banks don't like, you will find that very difficult to buy. So for example, if you buy a specialized student accommodation property, Quite often these have really good yields. Quite often investors really love them. Quite often they give you nice cash flow, but the banks don't like them because they don't have the broad appeal of the owner-occupier market to resell, so they rate them down. Um, if you were to invest in a hotel room, same deal. They don't have control over the asset. It's controlled by a larger company. They don't like that. They don't like buying assets that are um, not um, standard titles. You might be in a company title, for example. The banks don't like that. If you buy holiday apartments where you're in a uh, very similar to a hotel the banks do not like these properties so there's clues that you get as a property investor if i want to actually make this easy because if we say that you've got to buy two or three investment properties you actually require the leverage you require the bank's cooperation so if i first of all go owner occupier the heart is invested in it. They're buying from emotion. And generally speaking, the banks like them because there's a bigger pool of people should they need to resell it. That's a tick versus um, the, the investors. Ben touched on this very well, but you need to actually accumulate multiple properties. So you do need to get the growth that comes from having the owner-occupier appeal that allows you to actually get the accumulation of enough assets in your portfolio to take advantage of the compounding that Ben just talked about. Because if we've got a long enough time horizon, what actually happens is the rent on the cash flow properties get overtaken by the growth properties if you've held it long enough. Because as the growth in the property happens, there's drag up from the rent that finds there's an equilibrium point where the rents are equal. And then all of a sudden, they exponentially jump in front. Because if you think about it, people want to buy um, positive cash flow properties now, which makes sense, right? Who wouldn't want to? But it might only be 10 bucks a week, which is 500 bucks a year positive. Or it might be 20 bucks, which is a thousand, right? So you can see that you have to accumulate a whole heap of these. And if you're compromising on growth to get it, you have to have multiple, multiple properties just to acquire enough positive cash flow to make it worthwhile 
that you can actually fund it in, um, fund your, you know, um, substitute out your working income for a passive income. So that is the reason why we've spent a lot of time on this podcast saying that owner occupier appeal is important. It's an emotional decision as investors. We want to get stuck in the slipstream and get taken along for the ride. We do not want to be the pioneer. We want to be the person who follows where the masses are going, and that's owner occupier appeal. And secondly, banks don't like it. So if you've got a buy and hold strategy, the number one person that you need to impress if you have a buy and hold strategy is the valuer. Because what's going to happen is you're going to send the valuer out in one year's time, two years time, three years time and say, can you please revalue that property that I bought back in 2019 or I bought back in 2016? Can you revalue that? Because I want to actually harvest some equity for whatever reason, but let's say it's to buy another investment property. You want the valuer to come in through the eyes of an owner occupier and when they fill in all of their details to provide a valuation that they send off to the bank, you want them to have all of the risk ratings that are in your favor so that there's no restrictions on the amount that the bank will lend you. And we go back to my original point of buying properties that banks like. So if it's the valuer that you're trying to impress and a valuer is a human being who will also be affected by emotion when they see the beautiful tree-lined street and they see the floor plan that really works and they see the fact that lots of people would probably line up and want to buy this, that actually gives them comfort to give a rating on the valuation that they can send off to the bank that allows you to achieve what you want to achieve. So this is not an ignorant question, Kate. It is a fundamental question that every property investor, in our view, who follows the plan that we believe in, needs to fully understand. If you do not understand why owner-occupier appeal is a critical element of a property investment um, portfolio strategy, um, it is it is you, you are it is a fundamental. Uh, piece of the puzzle that you need to understand. So hopefully a combination of the the real life anecdotal stuff that Ben just shared around um, a tale of two suburbs and also just the human side of what it takes to, you know, it, it is an imperfect asset. Property is an imperfect asset. There are inefficiencies that we are looking to exploit through having superior knowledge and superior understanding of the market. And one of those things that you can use to put in your favour is understanding um, the value of ha- having owner occupier appeal. Well said, mate. Well said. All right. All right, mate. Well, um, hopefully that's helped a few people today, mate. Are property investors evil? That was the first question we had from Boyd. Um, is SMSF a strategy that we consider from Milland regarding whether that's something we should do? And then, of course, um, we've revisited a very fundamental on this podcast Uh, with talking about owner-occupier appeal. So hopefully that's been of benefit um, to our community. And um, if you know someone who might benefit from understanding some of those fundamentals around property investment, perhaps you could take a screenshot uh, right now of the cover of the podcast that you're listening to and maybe text it to a friend or put it on social so that they can um, be the beneficiaries of that as well. Hey, my life hack today, Ben, is there is a Netflix series that um, I've been watching with Andrea that's really good. It's called Live to 100, Secrets of the Blue Zones. I don't know if you've seen this. Um, But what it does is it studies... um, The the, the reason they're called Blue Zones is because they have um, an above average number of centurions, people who live to 100 or more. And they go into these places and they try and uncover some of the secrets... Um, that people are doing. Um, have you seen it? No, I've just seen like areas in, in Italy and all that where they're, they're you know, yeah. their diet. So, yeah, so I've seen versions of it, but I haven't seen it. Versions of it, right? So um, so the first episode, they went to the Okinawa people in Japan, right? And um, uh, so uh, one of the principles that they do is something that since I watched it, which was um, maybe four weeks ago, I've been implementing and it's um, and it's I, I found immediate benefit straight away. So I'm going to drip feed a few of these um, throughout the um, the next couple of weeks, Ben, nice. as, as life nice. hacks. But the first one is Hari Hachi Bu. This is the Okinawa people. Hari Hachi Bu, and basically what that means is eat to eighty percent full. Eat to eighty percent full. Don't need to go to one hundred percent. Go to eighty percent full. And why does that matter? Well, it puts less stress on your digestive system. It helps these people um, move um, and have more energy. It helps them sleep 
um, better at night. So I did this, Ben, because I must admit I fell into some um, – I've, I've actually always been pretty good with what I eat, and but um, I think that uh, COVID derailed a lot of us, Ben, and so what I did is I started to eat more than I needed to and snack more yeah. than I needed to. And so what I did is I – I've peeled this back and gone to the Hari Hachi boot eating to 80%. And it and it is and it's been good. Helps me sleep better. It also allows me to um, uh, wait and see if I leave a little bit of time, um, once it goes through my system, do yeah. I actually get a bit fuller later on anyway? Or am I just trying to eat like food's going to um, run out and it's going to dissolve if I don't eat it in 10 minutes, mate? So... Um, so I've lost a bit of weight and I'm not someone who has to worry too much about that, but I was developing a few handles where they shouldn't be, Ben. So um, it, uh, it's something that I'm, I'm a proponent of and I wonder if some people listening to this might be able to do a bit of hurry, hutchy, boo, Ben. Eat to 80% of what you need to and see what that looks like. Love it. Oh, I know I should be doing a little bit more of it myself. <laughs> Uh, very good. All right, mate. Um, I'm looking forward to what's making property news today because we're going to unpack a bit more about the PIPA sentiment survey. Yeah, well, we're sort of, you know, we're going to just unpack a couple of some of the insights. We'll do this over the next few weeks as well. But um, one of the interesting one was, and this is what we've been on about in terms of the costs of running an investment property. They are starting to get very, very expensive to run. And so we asked the question inside the, the survey, is when compared to last year, how much have your holding costs increased? And 6% of people said less than 10%. 26% of people said between 11 and 25%. 24% between 26 and 40%. 17% said 41 to 60. And then 6% said 61 to 80. 5% said... 81 to 100, 9% said greater than 100. Um, and then there was not applicable or, um, you know, 1% said uh, there'd be no increase. So if you add the 26 and the 24 and the 17, you're in that sort of 76, sorry, 67 sort of bracket. Of, so there's been of between 11 and 60% increases. That's, yeah. that's, that's material, right? So that's the challenge that we're seeing when it comes to um, holding costs. And I thought the other one, I thought we'll finish on a positive, Rose. <laughs> Such a positive. Okay, so we're ranking the states from, from, so from an investor's point of view, which state, in other words, which is the most attractive state based on the rules and regulations and the costs, stamp duty and the taxes and charges, which is the best state in Australia to invest in? So let's count them down from worst to best, shall we, Bryce? Drum yeah, roll, yeah, please. Yeah. Drum roll. Here. All right. The worst state in Australia to invest in residential property is Victoria. Come on. No, Surely not. No, really? Why would they say that? Oh, I couldn't believe that that would be the right answer. <laughs> Coming in at number seven <laughs> is the Northern Territory. So yeah, I need well, to read, we can't even beat Northern Territory. I Thank need you. to read into that a little bit more, right? Northern Territory, that's because, you know, they don't have stamp duty or something like that. I think I have to remember that. Um, okay, coming in at number six, the other state we believe is a shocker and you should never invest in is the ACT. Uh, their mm. land tax thresholds, uh, they've got obviously rental caps, um, so don't waste your money in investing in the ACT people. You will be thoroughly oh, disappointed. In terms the of ACT people. now, in terms of number five, and I think their number has gone up in terms of worst, um, based on some silly things that they've done recently, is Queensland. Queensland you know, trying to impose a national land tax grab uh, didn't work for them, but obviously investors have long memories. Um, so they're not trusted as much as they used to be. Coming in at number four for best investor is New South Wales. They have a no mm. grounds eviction at the moment. So, but if they change that, I suspect they're going to fall down in the order um, if they play around with that. Coming in at number three, Tassie. Little Tassie. Tassie, I think we can. I think we can, you know, in terms of punching above their weight down in Tasmania probably also because it's pretty affordable down there as well. 
coming in at number two and probably the hottest market in the country as we currently report to you, Western Australia, That's who decided exciting. not to introduce the no grounds eviction notice uh, because they already had basically a falling number of rental property. Well, I tell you, the investor is loving you at the moment and there's plenty of activity in the Western Australian market. And then coming in at number one, which has been Australia, the best performing state in terms of capital growth over the last three to five years, um, or certainly over the last three years, is the South Australian Adelaide markets and all of the fringe markets around that. People have been basically buying up anything around three to 400,000 in the fringes, in the regions, anywhere where they can get their hands on property there. And that seems to be the, the buzz thing that all of these new millennials are buying. So um, there you go. South Australia comes in at number one. And again, they have no tenancy reforms um, that are of note. And that's probably another good reason why there's a little bit of confidence going in to that market as well. But there you go. Counting down rankings from worst to best states in Australia to invest. So I've got a number of properties in Victoria, Ben. So just for the, for the folk at home, um, I'm not planning on selling them. So obviously uh, not excited by the fact that um, uh, the the Victorian uh, economy or the Victorian state government is um, disincentivizing uh, property investors. But mate, I'm just I'm just writing a note to our team here, mate, just uh, to expect a few emails from our Northern Territory, our ACT, and our Tassie friends for um, uh, what they're about to well, write in I about can, how you what I can commented tell you on their about, market. What I can tell you is these rankings do move around. We've been doing this for decades and we know that in the short term, dumb political decisions will eventually be overturned and then what you will see is opportunity in that particular market as they realise um, that they're not getting the tens of billions of dollars in investment that they want and that they desperately need to provide and rental provide incentives. And so they start <laughs> providing incentives. So, yes, you know, obviously that was in jest, a bit of fun, but it is serious. Victoria does need to change their legislation. Um, if they don't, um, it's going to get worse before it gets better in terms of for renters um, uh, and property owners in this state. But over the longer term, you, you must have property in Victoria, New South Wales, in my humble opinion. Yes. No, I'd actually back that up too, Ben, wherever possible, if you can afford those markets 100% because that's where the population is and that's not going to change anytime soon. So a uh, special shout out to today's uh, featured guests, uh, to Boyd, uh, to Milland, and also to Kate for their wonderful questions. Folks, I want to encourage you uh, to go to the propertycouch.com.au. There's a little widget on the front page there. It says speak pipe. All you need to do is press one button, put your name in, push record, leave a message uh, and you can be a part uh, of our podcast uh, community and get your questions answered as well. And anyone who... Right. And do they get a start and build course, Bryce? Sorry, just to interrupt well, there. Do they get, a, they get a start and build course? Words right out of my mouth, mate. Well spotted, Ben. So for anyone who gets read out um, on our podcast, just reach out to our team and we will give you a complimentary copy of our start and build. And um, anyone who... Uh, leaves a review, Ben, uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks that we read out. Uh, we'll give them a complimentary copy of our new course. Um, so go over to iTunes and Google Play and Spotify and all those places and leave us a review and we'll read them out. And so we can give you a part of you, uh, give you an opportunity for that as well, which is going to be a ripper course. I'm super pumped. Um, about releasing that to our community shortly. But, uh, mate, we covered a bit today. Um, yeah. Always a pleasure to hang out with you. Um, enjoy that uh, replay with your mates. Um, total immersion um, in uh, the Collingwood replay, mate. But until next week. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. Well said. See you next week, folks.